So let's get the day started. Three, two, one. Here we go. The kitchen. How wonderful. Wafting aromas. How it makes mouths water. Like an open shop of sweets. It breeds spices. Incense from the puja room wakes in the morning to the noise of churning butter, of vessels being scrubbed. The earthen oven gets a fresh much wash, decks herself for the burning from the small change in the box of spices and seasoning. We bought ourselves sweets, played home, played at being cooks with jaggery and lentils. It was a magic world. The kitchen snared my childhood, remained a spell, a passion. Wisps of childhood, shadows lifted. It's no longer a playground. They taught me kitchen us here. My shaping started here. Mother, grandmother, all the mothers in the house, they say, learn their motherhood here. A kitchen now is a graveyard with corpses of all kinds, tins, dishes, sacks. It hangs there in the smoke, clouds from damp firewood, fears, despair, silence lurking there. Mother floats like a spirit. She looks like the morning kitchen herself. Her eyes ran out of tears long ago. Her hands are worn out with the endless scrubbing. Look, she does not even have hands anymore. She looks like a ladle, a bowl, a piece of kitchen bric-a-brac. Sometimes she looks like a flaming oven, sometimes a trapped tigress. Restless, she paces the kitchen floor, bangs pots and pans. How easily, they say, with a flick of the ladle, the cooking gets done. None comes this way except to eat. My mother is empress of this kitchen empire, but the name on pots and paints is my father's. Fortunately, they said, I fell into a good kitchen. Gas stove, grinder, sink and tiles. I make cakes and puddings, not old fashioned things like mother. Still the name on everything is my husband's. My kitchen wakes to the whir and hisses of the grinder, the hiss of the pressure cooker. I move like my modern kitchen, a wind up toy. My kitchen is like a workshop. It's like a butcher shop with its babble. Washing what has been washed endlessly, cooking and serving, cooking and serving, scrubbing and washing. There's a kitchen in my dreams. The smell of spices, even in the jasmine. Damn this kitchen. Damn this kitchen. Inhuman. It sucks our blood. Robs us of hopes and dreams. A demon. A vulture. Eating into us. Bit by bit. All our lives. Kitchen culture. Kitchen talk. Reduced to kitchen maids and cooks. Let's smash these kitchens for making ladle wielding our duty. No more names on kitchen things. Let's uproot these separate stuffs. Our children are about to enter these lonely kitchens. Come for their sake. Let's demolish these kitchens now. Come for their sake. Let's demolish their kitchen now. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is me, Anand Krishnamurti from RC Cochin Kalur, and welcome to another session, session number nine of MEG5. And here today we have we get started with neighbors Avasita na Shivangi ji na video ta na nakrete na koi expressions ta bas avas ka khel ta jo aapko shayad pasand hoga mujhe pata hai. So yeah, thank you so much for that word, voice acting. Uh, thank you. So here we are today. And if you are wondering why I'm reading a poem, or I began by reading a poem from MEG 14 by Vimala. The poem is simple, Kitchen. Two names that you won't forget, Kitchen and Vimala. Right? So simple. Okay? 
So if, if, if at all you wonder why I am starting my session with uh, that poem, there is a reason. There are horses for courses, they say. You know? Yeah. So the reason. All right. So the reason why I started with that poem by Vimala is because today we are going to deal with, I had hinted about that yesterday. Today we are going to deal with the feminist literary studies or feminist literary theories or feminist literary critics. So it is going to be an extensive day in the sense that this is going to be a session of diachronic feminism. What is this? Diachronic feminism. I haven't heard somewhere. You know? A diachronic attempt on feminism. A diachronic class on feminism. What is a diachronic? What does the word diachronic mean? We have discussed that while discussing Ferdinand de Saussure. What does diachronic mean? What does diachronic mean? Diachronic means across the ages, not during the time, but across time. For instance, when I speak about, say, a transition from 1670 to 1970, then that becomes a diachronic study. So today, we are going to attempt a diachronic run down the timeline of feminist literary criticism. Well, it's not purely textual or syllabi wise, or it's not purely your block set, because there are quite a lot of inferences and allusions that needs to be brought from daily life. If you, if, if you are Malayali, for instance, or if you're a Tamilian, for instance, when I read that poem out, more than that poem, if you're a Telguite, yes, you may have read Vimala's original Telugu poem uh, with this, uh, these lines, which are translated into English. Uh, MEG 14 is modern Indian literature and translation. So that's why that poem features in it. But if you are a Malayali or if you are a Tamilian, you uh, maybe the first thing that came to your mind would have been a movie that was released recently called The Great Indian Kitchen. In Malayalam, it had Nimisha Sajayan in the lead and in Tamil, it had Aishwarya Rajesh in the lead. So just in case we have watched that. Even otherwise, I know you don't need to have any allusions. You, you, maybe most of you may just need to have a look at your own premises, the day-to-day -day life and how gendered uh, our society and family is and how we live a gendered life in itself would be sufficient enough for you to realize the amount of stereotyping and shit and conditioning that you are going through in your daily life or day-to-day -day life, day-to-day -day affairs. So today, at this particular point of time, I kickstart our inquiry into the evolution of feminist literary studies or criticism. In doing so, there requires, there necessitates a basic preliminary discussion on the very beginning of feminist literary criticism. For that, I often take this case of caste reservation. I know it's a very problematic domain to dig into. Uh, there could be biased opinions. There could be people who would be divided into two different platforms. But then this is something that I draw before I get started with the feminist literary origins. So why am I drawing caste preservation into this particular class on feminism? There's a reason. While I started my career as a teacher, uh, this has been there for the last 20, 25 years. Okay, it's as per the UGC norms. I'm talking something apart from literature. I'm talking about literary studies. And I'm not sure how many of you have observed or realized this. There are certain igno classes where I speak about these governmental hidden politics that we often overlook. Even if it's recorded, sometimes I go on board about these hidden agendas. What is a hidden agenda? Allow me a couple of minutes of digression just to give this connectedness. So I always tell this to my learners. Pehle, let's say during 1960s and 1970s, if somebody had to teach in a college, all that was required as a qualification was an MA. Because not many people went to do an MA, that is a post-graduation. And not many people, even if they did it, could clear MA or could pass MA, pass their masters, that is. So back then, an MA remained a qualification for somebody to become a college lecturer or a professor, as we call it. Back then, 60, 64, 65 marks used to be the rank 
like nobody got more than that i completed my post graduation in 2013 2011 13 i i belong to the last batch before cbcss which is called as choice based credit semester system i belong to a season where we were annual learners pura ek ek saal ka hota tha hamara degree pg wagera an entire year where we spent 8 to 10 months on doing all the mischiefs including arts sports all the gumna nachna things and eventually last two three months we got to our textbooks we read we entered the classrooms and we completed our degree but ever since 2013 we have this choice based credit semester gatia system cbcss where you have semester so within the semester you have two internal examination then a main examination it keeps recurring between the years and uh, the students ka to baad mein gaya we had let's say, i still remember we had maybe five to nine textbooks per paper i'm not talking about blocks i'm talking about textbooks like you have in mg2 or mg3 for that sake but if you look at the cbc as a syllabus anywhere in india you would see that there are 30 to 50 textbooks in a single paper for the students forget a deeper layer of understanding i i doubt even if they have a surface layer of understanding that's why i keep telling that at least for the time being you the igno learners the distant learners are privileged because whatever you learn at least you have very little to learn and you have all the privilege to learn it with a year or two at your disposal so that's not our that's not a point here so back then in 1970s bus ma chahiye tha if you want to become a college next but as times passed by quite a lot of requirements were added to it you need to have an mphil you need to have a phd you need to have uh, the ugc net examination cleared and so on and so forth and if you want to teach in schools b ed was a qualification currently uh, there is no one year b ed you have to do b ed two years so what is the hidden agenda behind this I'm not talking about an igno learner, but let's take let's take the case of a an average regular learner, somebody who is into you know a, a regular mode of learning. They complete the post graduation if there is no lag that is somewhere when they are twenty, twenty one, twenty two, twenty three years old. So if the parameter is that you can become a teacher if you if you are twenty two, twenty three years old, you are full of young blood. you are full of vigor you have the knowledge you want to teach like when i did my post graduation i was so excited to go to my classes not at now i am not but then due to 10 years of experience we get the knack of teaching we we tend to learn a lot of things but then back then we were so eager to learn or to teach of course as we age there are quite a lot of things that creeps in health issues fever wagera wagera and then familial issues mental trauma uh, agony existential crisis money matters a lot of things so for the governments like priti agarwal ji has said if somebody passes or becomes a post graduate by 23 and if this is the rule then that becomes a trouble because you have to create job opportunities you have to take those people to the academy so the bar has been lifted why warna at 23 you are full of vigor what will happen you have you are a post graduate you don't get the job you will take a stone pelt wherever you want to you will say zindabad murdabad mukhyamantri rajiv you know step down chief minister prime minister whoever and then there will be quite a lot of chaos so now what happens by the time you complete your degree two years of b ed maybe two years of m ed net pe to bahut sare work lag jata hai i mean it's a fluke sometimes you get in immediately when you pass sometimes it takes 5 years 6 years 7 years people don't clear net phd ka to 3 saal bolte hain lekin 4 5 6 saal to lag hi jata hai so by the time you undergo all this farce all the circus your age would be somewhere about 30 31 32 33 by then hopefully you would be married or you would be about to be married you would have children you would have parents who are getting much older because you are 32 33 you will have uh, um, children so you will have uh, you will have parents to take care of elderly parents to take care of so you would think 10 times before doing all these protests and you would kaam chalayenge in whichever manner you have no the reason why i am telling this we are we are discussing on uh, feminism you uh, block number 6 sushri sushri mahapatra ji so we are coming to that but i am setting a backdrop to it sorry mg5 yeah mg5 blocks feminist literary criticism okay so 
Uh, are kaha kaya? Yeah. So, so, so the reason why we have to do all these farces because by then we will become quite old. So back then when I started teaching my career in 2013, October, November, something. So yeah, the fast that I'm telling you, tell you is that there is this UGC run regulation which binds the formation of our syllabus and everything. So you would be able to recollect irrespective of which subject you choose for your degree. I'm talking about your BA days or BSc days. So whatever subject you choose, for the first two years, you only have one core paper each for the four semesters. Let's say you took economics. You have only one core paper of economics or let's say if you took physics, one core paper of physics for the first four semesters. In the, in the last, last two semesters, that is the third year, fifth and sixth semester, you have four core paper each. And Upar say you have dissertation and viva. So what happens in the first two years, irrespective of which subject you choose, whether it is physics or uh, biology or chemistry or max or English or economics, for the first two years, you have to mandatorily study what they call as common codes and languages. So common course is basically English, which teaches you basic uh, group discussion skills, uh, communication skills, interview skills, phonetics, and so on, and some prose and poetry. And language could be your native language, Malayalam, Hindi, Tamil, Telugu, Gujarati, Marathi, whatever. So a learner who has, let's say, chosen economics because they are fond of Adam Smith or Amartya Sen, doesn't get to learn this pe these people until the third year. And third year, you have eight core papers plus project and viva. You feel so pathetic. You, you discover that you are not fit for the subject. And you become a dropout in the third year. You have spent two valuable years of your life. And in the third year, you realize that you can't clear the scores. You drop out. Right? So this is how interesting the system is. So while I started teaching, I had to teach common course papers. So in the first year, there was a paper called Communication Skills in English, in which I had to take a lecture on group discussion skills. I still remember that book and the topic that was there. So all the units, Sushri Mahapatraji, we are dealing with that extensive block on feminist literary criticism. That's why I said it's a diachronic lecture, starting from Mary Wollstonecraft to um, Elaine Showalter or further from there, if time permits that is. So yeah, going back to the experience that I'm drawing from. So back then, uh, I had this unit on group discussion. So there are three types of topics for group discussion, factual, abstract, and controversial. So controversial topic, the example that was given in the text that is prescribed for study is, caste preservation occurs. I repeat, caste preservation occurs. I understand the controversiality in that topic. But then if you had to make it, a, you know, slightly impartial, the topic should have been caste preservation, a boom or a curse. It is still controversial if you have the topic in your discussion. But then a very academic textbook, which is an academic product, which is trying to, you know, involve students in an academic discourse, has a question that's put for a group discussion in a very biased, biased manner. So I said, I'm going to begin discussions on feminism. And I said, I'll draw caste reservation to the center. You may wonder why. Because back then in that class, I asked my learners, or every single year I teach that, I taught that book until it was removed from the syllabus. I began my discussions by asking my students, what are your thoughts on caste reservation? Yes, based on where we are, what we are, we, we are entitled to have our own different views. We can say, uh, Muskanji, I think you need to log out and log in. It must be a network issue from your end. Am I not louder to others? You're not audible, sir. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, uh, so we are entitled to our own perspectives and views. But then I asked them, what are your views on preservation? So there are people who are like, we are for you know, um, economic reservation. Reservation should be done away with. Caste reservation is actually a curse. And then there were people, feeble voices like caste reservation helps and social upliftment. It has a social role to do. And reservation is not about economics. It's more about social equity. So there are quite a lot of sensible discussions that ensued. So, so I told them a story, a story that I begin all my feminist 
डिस्कशन होता आई गेट डीपर इन टर्म्स ऑफ द थियरीज इन वायल फ्रॉम नाउ बट आई एम बिगिनिंग द डिस्कशन आस्किंग यू वट इज द फर्स्ट नोन फेमिस्ट लिटरेरी थियरी दैट यू कम अक्रॉस यू वुड हैव स्टडीड इन द डिग्री और इफ यू लुक एट योर ब्लॉक्स वट इज द फर्स्ट नेम दैट कम्स टू योर माइंड uh rose amu i can see your hands raised is it by accident or do you have a question rose amu okay that's all right so we have 65 people in the house so what is the first name that you are familiar with the moment we speak about feminist literary criticism yes navya devi go on virginia wool Okay, so you, you you are that far. Okay, much before Virginia Woolf. Yeah, no, no, definitely for sure. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Yeah. So yes, Mary Wollstonecraft is one name that people may be familiar with if you have done it during your uh, bachelor's. Mary Wollstonecraft is a name that people would be familiar with. I'm talking about chronology. Okay, I'm not talking about who's the feminist that has inspired you. You may speak about Kiran Bedi. You may speak about uh, Virginia Woolf. You may speak about maybe Toril Moi or Simon de Beauvoir or anybody. But I'm talking in a chronological sense. What is the first thing that comes to your mind at the moment you speak about feminist literary criticism? So Mary Wollstonecraft is the name that first surfaces into our presence. So my first question begins there. When was the work? of Mary Wilson Croft which we discuss as a seminal work on feminist literary criticism published the name is vindication of the rights of women when was vindication of the rights of women published anybody are nay 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 not that far much earlier than that much earlier than that priti ji 1899 to bahut 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 1792 it was published in year 1792 now my second question glad that navya took the name of virginia woolf when was virginia woolf's a room of one soon published that's a second better known attempt on feminist literary criticism so when was a room of one soon published 1929 thank you thank you for that 1929 Is the year? See, when I ask you a question like this, which is factual, you need not really be, uh, you know, muted because you don't know the answer. You can simply Google and let me know. This is just a rhetorical question. So, in 1929, we have a room of one stone published. Now, two basic, simpler observations. अरे 1792 मतलब BC को forget करो, BC forget करो, AD में आके 1792 years it took for a feminine voice to be heard ain't that a shame almost 1800 years you haven't heard a voice of feminist criticism starting point i'll come to that later i'll come to mary wilson craft maybe a couple of minutes or 5 minutes later now look at the second one virginia wolf This is the second recognizable voice that we have. कितने साल लगे? इतना वर्ष और तो. Almost 150 years. Not exactly 150. It's 137. But almost 150 years it took for another female to voice for women's rights. Ain't that a shame? 1929, ladies and gentlemen. The third one that we would talk about. Happens in 1949 by Kate Millett, called Sec. No, no, not Kate Millett. Simone de Beauvoir, that to a French author, called The Second Sex. Then comes 1953, Kate Millett, Sexual Politics. I could have maybe inverted this. This could be the other way around. Pardon me for that. But nonetheless, almost 1800 years for the first voice to be heard. Another 150 years for the next to be heard. That too, because I'll come to that while I lecture about Virginia Woolf. That too, because she was born to a filthy rich academic family, the Bloomsbury Group. Otherwise, would Virginia Woolf be able to write what she had? Is a question mark. Then, let's say another 20 years later, another two decades later, you have the third recognizable voice. Ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about the rise and development of feminism in literary critical thought. 
So imagine the beginning of feminism, the role that women played in life across the globe and how they were treated across the globe. Doormat is a phrase that we often use. Doormat. Across the ages, across cultures, across languages, across the gendered perspective. Yes, we don't number the genders, but then the second gender in the binary opposition, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to discussions on feminism. We are going to discuss, or we are going to get started with number one, Mary Wollstonecraft. So who is Mary Wollstonecraft? Well, I ask this question almost randomly in all my classes. And the answers I, that I get are really baffling. Most of them say the beginner of feminism, the first feminist voice. Then there are people who identify her as the mother of Mary Shelley. Mary Shelley who has written the first sci-fi novel. The name of the first sci-fi novel? Frankenstein. Frankenstein, spot on Param. So Mary Shelley who penned Frankenstein. Then there comes this observation where people say Mary Wollstonecraft is the mother-in-law of Percy Bysshe Shelley. Percy Bysshe Shelley the Ammayan Mayanasar. Right? We, we recognize the first, the principal author of feminist literary criticism under the address of a guy that to not her husband, not her father, but her daughter's husband. Well, paradoxes, a, a group of paradoxes for you to ponder about. Okay, so let's get started with Mary Wollstonecraft. Yes, she is a woman, or she can be called as a woman's rights activist. Shivangiji. But the problem is, how do you label this women rights activism way back in 1792? Forget 1792. Let me just add to the introductory discussion. The reason why I'm being so digressive today is this is the base. This is the foundation. If you understand this base, then it's okay for you to go back and read whatever texts. That's why I'm spending this much time within, despite our limited schedule. Okay. Don't feel angry about me or angry at me. Okay. So the reason why, okay, the, the, the extension of the discussion of the introduction or the beginning, the inception of feminist liberalism is also that. Forget the case of 1790s. And I'm not talking about India. Take the case of all the so-called developed countries. Britain, France, England, I mean America, Japan, China, or whichever country you want to include, including India. Up until, let's say, the latter half of the 20th century. Yes, I'm talking about post-1950s. You look anywhere across the globe, anywhere in the history, in the annals of history, you would be puzzled by the sort of inequality with which women were treated. It was like normal back then. It was not like you are treating me inequally, unequally, and you are, you know, not giving me freedom. It was like normal. Gender stereotypes are kitchen mein sadna hai, bache ko dekhpaal karna hai, bacha peda karna hai. The same stuff, the same shit. I'll tell you how. I'm not sure whether you would believe these things, but you can go back and Google and double check. Up until the early half of 19th or 18th century, women did not have rights to individual existence as if the entire globe had read Manusmriti. You know the, those lines from Manusmriti, right? Nastri Satvi Kamasti. She doesn't deserve freedom. On birth, she is under her father, then under her husband, then under her son. This stereotypical shit was existent across the globe, not only in India, across the globe. Women did not have right to live under anyone except this. Up until a point, they were under the custody of their father. If the father is non-existent, uncle, yeah, whoever is alive as a male in that family, followed by her husband, husbands, whichever way you look at it, and later by her children. So what if these people are no more? 
that's how the horror begins when i discuss feminism that's where stark reality creeps in if your father is dead and the one who wedded you he need not be dead he can leave you right he can divorce you not legally back then but he can simply say i don't want you as a wife i'm marrying somebody else or he dies if your husband abandons you what are, what all happens i'll tell you you don't have rights on the children that you have had from them i hope you understand you bear children from your husband and if he says i don't want you anymore you don't have any claims to the children that you had you don't have any claims towards property jayadat or money women do not have financial independence education to dete nahi women could never go to colleges or schools i told you up until a point there were only two universities oxford and cambridge in england it was mostly monastic teachers and uh, men were students well outcast is too little a word to describe this bafflement and embarrassment and uh, what we call today as human rights violation uh, absolute violation that women felt or discrimination that they felt so they don't have right towards their own children they don't have property rights they don't have education they don't have they can't go for job they have absolutely no entitlement to anything so what happens if your husband dies or if he deserts you there are only two options or rather three options that a woman has to remarry or to seek refuge in and other elderly men in the family who would generally refuse to do that especially uh, uncles and cousins or brothers they may they not probably take her back because it's a shame to the family all over the world i'm not talking about india okay second option go to bedlam b e d l a m bedlam means a lunatic asylum pretend that you are mad get enrolled in a lunatic asylum kam se kam you will get a room and a, and some food of course they'll ill treat you maybe they'll try to immolate you they may try to misbehave with you but then you have a shelter number 3 okay sorry number 3 all right just in case the network gets disconnected please don't panic i'll rejoin okay so number 3 the third option you have is get into prostitution these are the only three options that a deserted woman had during those days up until a point and this is not the only case whatever new comes in let's say elections come in women do not have the right to vote you add anything to it kuch bhi naya aata ho that belongs to men initially monopoly of men so how did women attain all these privileges or basic necessities how did women go to schools or colleges what existed was domestic education back then. so how did women go to these you know knowledge gaining spaces how did women begin to work how did women gain at least a voice to have independent existence how did they raise voice to have a you know financial power how did they get adult no what existed was adult franchise how did they get female franchise that movement of the early 20th or 21st century is called suffragette movement if you want to go and google that it's not part of your syllabus we are not going to discuss that in detail but if you want you can go back and read google suffragette movement or you take any other woman apartheid or rosa parks incident uh, martin luther's struggle for black liberation all these are men centered women comes later so how did they achieve that rebellion revolt revolution struggle all this can be summed up under the umbrella term feminist literary movement no that's not where it ends i started with reservation i'll come to that a little while later while discussing mary wollstonecraft so kick started with kick starting with mary wollstonecraft because because we have only another 95 minutes so very quickly rushing through mary wollstonecraft if you are writing lecture notes a few points for you to get started with 
So Mary Wollstonecraft writes what is called a vindication of the rights of women in 1792. It was not her first work. Much before that, she had written quite a lot of essays and works. One that you should remember is a, a vindication of the rights of men in 1790. A vindication of the rights of men. Vindication means defense, in support of. So in 1790, the person whom you just now identified as the first principal voice in feminist literary criticism renders her voice in defense of men. Another paradox. 1790, Mary Wollstonecraft says, in defense of men, as a response to Edmund Burke's reflections on revolutions of uh, on the revolutions in France, which was written in 1789. I hope you would remember that. In 1789, um, after the revolution, French Revolution, Edmund Burke uh, writes a, a work called uh, reflections on the revolutions of France, in which he accuses, he makes quite a lot of accusations about, accusations about Mary Wollstonecraft's friend. I forgot his name. Though. So in defense of him, he, she writes a work called Vindication of the Rights of Man or Men. In 1792, she comes up with a vindication of the rights of women with strictures in political and moral subjects. Needless to say, it became a landmark work. Vindication primarily is an extension of Mary Wollstonecraft's arguments that she makes in uh, Vindication of the Rights of Men. She, she continues from where she left. And uh, at this point of time, we must also take into account a couple of other works, especially if you have an essay on Mary Wollstonecraft or Feminist Literary Studies. Yes, Pooja Kumariji, since you have a question. Or is it by accident? Pooja ji? Okay, sir, no worries. So, again, two references to allusions which you could go back to later and double check. One by Wollstonecraft herself. She wrote an essay in 1787. Again, it will be, it'll be important for you uh, if you discuss uh, education of daughters. If there's a short note, on education of daughters, then you have to discuss not only vindication, but also this essay that she wrote in 1787. The essay is titled Rational Education for Women. No, I'm sorry. Uh, Thoughts on the education of daughters. I'm sorry. Thoughts on the education of daughters written in the year 1787. I repeat. Thoughts on the education of daughters by Mary Wollstonecraft is an essay written in the year 1787. On parallel, even though we recognize Mary Wollstonecraft as the first voice, a year before Mary Wollstonecraft, there was this feminist critic called Olympe de Gaugue, O-L-Y-M-P-E-D-E-G-A-U-G-E, -E -E -E, Olympe de Gaugue, or Gauge, whichever way you want to pronounce her. She had written a work in 1791, that is one year before Mary's vindication, titled Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. I repeat, Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen. Declaration of the Rights of Women and the Female Citizen, 1791, Olympe de Cog. Of course, in view or in the light of the French Revolution, she was trying to speak about women's rights and how she needs to have a representation in the legal system. So in 1792, we have Mary Wollstonecraft emerging and Mary Wollstonecraft speaks about the need to have women's rights. But before going to Mary Wollstonecraft's theories, let me again take a few minutes of digression and talk to you about the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. I know I am digressing and we are short of time, but then that's also because nobody else, gonna, nobody else is going to tell you these stories, not even Google. And if I don't tell you these stories, maybe unless you read vigorously and vociferously and are into the Routledge or Oxford Companion series or Critical Edition series, you may not probably get to know these things. And these stories may help you in understanding and appreciating these theorists and their works better. 
So only because of that, I'm giving you a short story, a kuttikar. So Mary Wollstonecraft, as you know, was a feminist, but not right away. Up until, let's say, she became 30, 32, she was a highly devoted religious woman. Let's say a stereotypical woman that you can imagine. The bahu, the ideal wife, the ideal mother, the ideal mother, the ideal daughter, the ideal devotee. That's what she was. She was a staunch believer. She was married to a man. And I think she had a, no, she didn't have a daughter back then, but she, she was married and she was pregnant or impregnated by that guy. She was carrying. And back then, when she was 30, 32 years old, she got an offer to go on a French trip. Not simply to go on a tour, on a, on a tour, but then to write a travelogue on the French tour. Her husband apparently encouraged Mary to expedite on that venture, to go on a French tour, enjoy France, write about the travel which happens in the ship, that is, and come back. Well, you may to, you may you may to feel like Are kaisa acha pati hai, how wonderful husband he is. Mary also taught the same because she was a writer, she was into creative things, and she it fascinated her. Travel, writing, everything fascinated her. And because she was encouraged to do this, she set out on the expedition to France. Yes, that is one of the uh, well-known works or attempts, first known attempts of Mary Wollstonecraft into writing. I forgot the name though. She wrote a travelogue. So she went to France. She toured France for a few days or months. And then she came back. Well, you can equate this with the scene that is not existent in Hamlet that I spoke to you in the second or third class. Hamlet's father dies. Hamlet takes a 45, 60 days of journey in ship, lands in Denmark, and is shocked. Why is it celebratory here? Why aren't black or mourning happening here? Where are people? Nobody has come to call me. So similarly, Mary Wollstonecraft, upon landing back on shore, is puzzled or is alarmed or startled by the fact that her husband has not come to pick her up. When she is pregnant, she left for the expedition with her, you know, uh, her child in her stomach. And she, when she comes back, it has become a bit more heavier. So she's expecting her husband to come and hug her and give her all the love and say, darling, I missed you. She didn't find him. She consoled herself saying, hota hai. he would have forgotten the date. Right? wedding date bhi So she finds excuses and thought, Chalo, ghar dek, ghar ja ke dek lete. So she starts walking to her house. She knocks. And she is devastated to discover that he has started living with another woman. Mercilessly. He throws her out without letting her, welcoming her in. Mind you, she is carrying this baby in her womb. Mary Wollstonecraft is shattered. Just like in movies, it starts raining. It starts pouring down. Maybe it's her tears that nature adopts. So it starts pouring down. She walks towards the Thames River. You would understand why. She decides to commit suicide. Then she walks around the Thames River three, four times with this heavy stomach. Why? Because when you get wet in rain, your dress becomes heavier. So if you jump, it becomes easier for you to drown. Even though I am saying this with a laugh in my face, imagine how the horror that she would have been experiencing back then. She has been betrayed by her most beloved man, whose child she is carrying, and all her hopes, hopes lost, abandoned, out of all the fears that has kick-started. She takes a tour around the Thames now, and then she dives into the river. We say, life is least filmy. But then in her case, up until this point, you could, have, you could have imagined this in a filmic way. The same happens after that as well. She dives into the river. Then 
a man by name William Godwin sees her jump into the river. He dives into the river and saves her from drowning and consoles her and eventually marries her to whom we have Mary Shelley and whatever happens. After her death, he also takes the pains to publish her memoir or autobiography or whatever you call that. He was a very devoted husband and that's where another paradox comes. As I told you, I'm not being stereotypical, I'm not being accusatory, but I'm just telling you the transition that Mary Wollstonecraft went through. Up until 3032, she was an extremely devoted, loyal, monogamous, religious wife. From the moment Godwin saved her, Godwin was so much into her. Always, it reminds me of the story Madame Bovary by Gustave Flaubert, the German novel, the epic novel that you would come across, one of the masterpieces in literature. In that, the same happens. Madame Bovary cheats on her loyal husband. Similarly, I'm not saying she cheated, but then she was into so many men. She became quite a lot liberal and she was into a lot of things that she never did up or dare to do up until 32, 33. And of course, she was still in good relationships with Godwin, uh, bore a child or two with him. And I think she died of tuberculosis or something prematurely. She died at a very, very young age. This is the life of Mary Wollstonecraft. Just to give you an idea of the, 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 the horrors that she went through. Okay, now talking about her theory, her, her contributions in vindication. So why did she write vindication? Because there are quite a lot of reasons. The work in, in itself is actually dedicated to a person called Charles Morris Talleyrand Perigot. Well, you need not worry about the spellings. Charles Morris would do. So it was against Charles Morris. It was dedicated to Charles Morris, who was a late Bishop of Auton, A-U-T-U-N, whose views on female education were, dist dis were distasteful to Wollstonecraft. It was not only about Charles Morris, but it was also about Rousseau. And uh, I think it was uh, Dr. Johnson or Sam yeah, Samuel Johnson, I, I suppose, uh, or Coleridge. No, I think it was Samuel Johnson. Uh, she was not happy with these people. And it was against them or their views on women. These people believed that women should not be educated. They should be, especially Rousseau, in a novel that he wrote, is it Russo or Johnson? I keep confusing. Okay, doesn't matter. You can go to the summary, it will tell you this. So, Russo. this fellow, is, yeah, Russo, Russo. Russo in his novel uh, expressed the opinion that women should be educated for the pleasure of men and nothing else. Because, what is the name of 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 was the view propounded by Rousseau. Same with this uh, bishop and quite a lot of contemporaries of Mary Wollstonecraft. So Vindication was written in response to all these contempt that these people nurtured on women or about women. But if you read the summary of Vindication from your blogs or from Google or wherever, you may question more. Because Mary Wollstonecraft in Vindication right from the beginning is accusing women of a lot of things. Mary says that these women are spaniels and toys. She says women are fragile. Remember frailty thy name is woman. Hamlet lashing out at his mother Gertrude in the first soliloquy like Niobe like tears. And it ends with the statement, frailty thy name is woman. You can imagine quite a lot of applause in the groundlings of the Shakespearean theatre. Yeah. Okay, I'm not going to that misogynical part, but then, yeah. So Mary Wollstonecraft accuses women of being silly and fragile. And she says that these women are least bothered about her husband's troubles. She says, these women only want to sit comfortably at the comfort of the home, the cushion of the home. They want to cook and bear children and produce children for their husbands. They want to feed their husband. 
read some silly magazines or novels and they just want to live a carefree life no no mary wilsoncroft is not at all sarcastic okay she means it when she says it she says these women simply want to live a comforting life comforting life bearing children producing and taking care of the children cooking for their husbands washing uh, clothes for them maybe even getting them ready even when they are 30 year old or 25 year old dishwashing for them and reading novels and simply spending time and wasting time one accuses that women are stupid how they don't have any concern for their husbands in malayalam we say kanni chore illatha rani pennugal how or why are their husbands are going every morning to work they are working from morning to evening and they are earning money for them for the family to run have you ever thought of the troubles that the men have to take they have to take all the pressure in their head they have to feed this many women at home and they have to take care of their needs and they have to satisfy them in every possible manner and what do these women do they simply refuse to share this burden and they simply enjoy the comfort of the four walls of the home why aren't they empathetic enough to ask their husband are mujhe raha nahi jata aapko aise kasht mein dekh ke give me an opportunity to study not domestic education but the proper public education give me an opportunity to study make policies that would take me to school and college so that i can also go to work and if not as much as you earn kuch to main aapke liye kar sakta hu like the squirrel did to rama no she doesn't say that that's my analogy like annara kannanu tanna laitu can you see the four sided vision that mary wilson craft has in a highly patriarchal misogynistic society she could not dare to speak as a feminist she could not ask for an equal fitting footing sorry so what could she do she bows down or she apparently appears to bow down and she accuses women that they are least bothered about their men she calls them all the sort of abusive words and she says why don't you plead to men why don't you fall on their feet and tell them that if we had this opportunity we could lessen your burden look at the visionary that she is a big salute hai na back in 1792 being the first representation of women yeah kind of reverse psychology back then that didn't exist you know so that's more of a vision a grand vision that she had so she accuses women of all these things and she tries to enlighten them and mind you i told you already back then women were not entitled to education what they were entitled to was domestic education so what is domestic education aaj bhi hota hai domestic education whether even if you go to schools or colleges you have domestic education what is the domestic education how to cook how to wash clothes how to be a good girl how to dress well how to please men how to attract men how to get married how to be a good daughter how to be a good wife how to be a good dash 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 domestic education you could see jane austen celebrating that you know only matchmaking and marriages belong to jane austen's universe because that typically reflects the, reflects the society that she was in the highly moral highly uh, marital society highly uh, monogamous society profane society so mary wilson craft had to retort to such politics so there were guide books so mary wilson craft didn't like the guide book writers guide book writers who wrote like how to be good daughters how to be good wives how to be a good mother you know so she she was critical of all these things so in vindication she tries to use this reverse psychology technique where she accuses women of being passive or less compassionate averse to take responsibilities and she urges them to 
bear these burden she urges them to take up these work so imagine someone like rousseau or charles morris or any other patriarchal men with a patriarchal mindset reading vindication he be smiling and like ha ha sahi hai sahi hai ye sab kitne darpo ke ye sab kitne lazy hai are sab ka mujhe hi karna padta hai i have to bear all the burden of my family she has some sense sharma ji shall we think of this can we give education for women that's how the thought the seed of thought is of teaching or of of you know college entry is sown by mary wilson craft i hope you understand this this is very simple so she attacks in that book conduct book writers like james fordyce f o r d y c e and john grigory conduct book how to be a good woman how to be a good mother how to be a good blah 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 so james fordyce and john grigory were two pioneers of conduct book writing so she condemns them as well as educational philosophers like rousseau who argue that women doesn't need a rational education Rousseau in his novel that I spoke about a little while later, a little while earlier, the name of the novel is Emily, written in the written in the year seventeen sixty two. In Emily, Rousseau argues that women should be educated for the pleasure of men. You know, हमें entertain करने के लिए we have to teach you. Then comes this pivotal chapter in Mary Wollstonecraft's. book but before coming to that let me also speak about the book there are total 13 chapters in that book she is critical of women their manners she also speaks about the socio cultural factors she says that women can't be forced to be domestic she says that novels hinder the intellect and education of women because novels are simple they they are they are simply ruining just like soap opera soap operas the serials that we watch they are trying to stereotype women into domesticated roles so hai na that novel that that, that show opera saas bhi kabhi bahuti correct right? quite a lot of things also. so uh, novels hinder the intellect and education of women chapter 13 sums up all her arguments and she details the various ways in which women indulge in their silliness accusatory tone that i already spoke about these include visiting museums fortune tellers and healers reading stupid novels engaging in rivalries with other women immoderately caring about dress and manners and indulging their children and treating them like idols she accuses all these things while she sums up but much before that in chapter 12 which is titled on national education she introduces an extremely radical concept which is the first step towards all this what is that radical concept it is what has actually enabled women to go and study with men i know it will take time for you to come with that particular terminology let me give you the scenario imagine a boys only school or a college or a class right this is a single gendered institution we still have quite a lot of those in kerala in ernakulam we have saint teresa's college where i am doing my research there is saint saviour's college saint albert's which used to be a men only space until 2005 6 yeah we have quite a lot of such colleges and schools which are girls only or boys only especially when it comes to girls only there are quite a lot of parents who send their children with the hope that they'll never get involved with a guy thank god right most of the malayalis would remember the movie chocolate where you have the rajan p dev's character who sends samrada sunil to the college to the women's college because all the other two daughters of his have run away or eloped with men so he hopes that samrada being in a women's college would never do that which eventually she does so yeah <clears throat> jokes apart uh imagine that <clears throat> space where only men study there are 50 seats we we recently speak about this reservation for uh, women in parliament a bill was passed recently after 12 13 years of discussions and debates 
tera sala for a common sense kind thing okay not getting political but then okay on a, on a, on a men's only space where you have 50 students 50 men study public education that is you have to get women in you can't say 25 25 you can't say 30 20 you can't even say 40 10 so how do women get in to schools and colleges i mean common women how would they get in what is the name of the system that would let let's say five women get into the system of 50 as in 45 5 ratio which would again be contested are ye ladkiyan aake padh ke kya karne wali hai inko kaun job dene wala hai are 45 mard hai socho ye panch ladkiyon ka kya hoga hai na kaant ho jayega are ram ram hai na so what is the name of the system that lets five women get into a system with 45 men into a classroom i call it reservation but nonetheless five or 15 or 25 or 30 or 40 10 10 40 whatever the system of a woman studying along with a man is called co education that radical concept was propounded by mary wollstonecraft ladies and gentlemen co education let ladkiyan be padhe with ladke hum to todi hi mang rahe hain aisa nahi ki hame raj karna hai if you let us study a little bit we will contribute to your misery a little bit we'll do some chota mota job and survive i call it reservation because when the system gets introduced what happens 50 men becomes 45 5 let's say it is introduced in 2023 i'm just giving an example okay let's say it's let's, let's say it's, it gets introduced in 1795 what happens in the year 1795 1796 1797 1798 what happens those five seats remain vacant at least four seats remain vacant and after a month that gets converted into men's quarter as i hope right if the seat is vacant and nobody comes to fill it then that again becomes the regular regular quarter that's a word you know the regular court so for four years five years six years seven years the 50 zero ratio remains at least 49 1 ratio remains or 48 2 ratio remains 47 3 ratio remains so what happens to this 1 2 3 they are laughed at they are asked ladki ho yahan aake karne kya wali ho they are laughed at because teachers are also male not women so they say Yeah, you remember that essay by Stephen Leacock on the need of a quiet college. If you haven't read it, you should read. Just two page essay, Canadian writer Stephen Leacock, one of the best essayist. He speaks about an ideal college, how a college should be, how the professors should be. Everything is perfect, except for the concluding paragraph. In the concluding paragraph, he says, "Of women in my college, oh no, thank you. If I let women into my college." they will ruin the academics malayalam is a kannum kayum kaanichu ende students ne maatralla ende adhyapakare avare adichondu poyi these women if i if i let them into my college they will not only make my students fall in love but they will also ank maar ke mere professors ko bhi chura ke le jaye they will ruin academics say stephen leacock in the 20th century in on the need for a quiet college so imagine 1792 so when you have women let into the college the 1 2 3 would be subject to abuse torture ridicule bias hai na pad ke bhi kya karne wale ho aap log waise to pass bhi nahi hote so amidst all this trauma how are they going to even pass they will obviously fail it will take 20 25 years for one student to pass i'm not talking about rank there could be a difference it could be a fluke an exception somewhere but then consistently it will take 20 years for somebody to pass it would call for a celebration dekho revolution ho gaya ladki pass ho gayi then from that one person 10 people would draw inspiration at least from her family and would get enrolled for school for education 
So again, the five seats will get filled. Of them, of that three would fail, two would pass. Again, five years later, ten years later, all the five would pass. A day would come. Now, if you were in an offline class, I would have asked you to look at each other. Go to any regular class, especially if you have a postgraduate class. We men, we men, are an extinct subject in classrooms. PG classrooms in particular. Or take the sex ratio. Jaha apko. पैंतालीस पे पांच बनना मुश्किल से होता था अल नापतंजी लंच कष्ट वी हाव रीच अट प्लेस वेर फिफ्टी यू हाव फाइव टू सेवन मेन फोर्टी थ्री वुमेन इन बीच इन बैचलर्स क्लास रूम आउट ऑफ द ट्वेंटी यू हाव नाइनटीन वुमेन इन क्लास एंड गाय दैट्स द रेवल्यूशन दट आई एम टॉकिंग अबाउट दैट इज द रेवल्यूशन दैट पीपल राइट फ्रॉम वोस्ट एंड क्राफ्ट stood for and this my dear friend is what reservation has done to them this is reservation this is exactly what caste reservation has also done to the marginalized we can have as many debates as we want we can discuss about anything somebody mentioned ambedkar the ambedkarite movement what did it do if you have watched the movie ambedkar which is available in youtube starring mamuti or if you have heard the stories he became a barrister a lawyer he went to teach in a in a staff room full of brahmins or upper caste people there was this kuja where there is what you know the mud pot with water ambedkar was banned or prohibited from drinking water from that he was asked to bring water from home one man the only man who became a teacher being a mahar now i won't say a radical revolution as much as what i have claimed right now regarding feminism has happened there but still the power structures have started to change there are quite a lot of marginalized people getting into power into positions into teaching into academics into army into doctorate into several things the struggle is still there but then there is this revolution which is facilitated by the thing called the soviet i am not sure how many of you have thought about this terminology pattika jati pattika varga this is actually an abuse to those people who belong there pattika is table just in case you don't know the table that we make in ms excel ms word etc so people who belong to that table the list of castes that are tabula and you say they belong to the reserved caste or reserved category isse bhi bada नेशनल एजुकेशन Where she brings forth this concept on co-education, you get short note Mary Wilson Crofts on education. So, for that you have to write this. So, she introduced this concept of co-education, which was far ahead of her times, to such an extent that she had to be she she was like abused by so many of her contemporaries. There was this guy called Horace Walpole, who was a minister back then. For writing vindication, he accused Mary Wilson Croft as a hyena in petticoats, a hyena, a wolf-like figure. the hyena in petticoats is what he called her okay so she emphasizes that women shouldn't be constrained by or made slaves to their bodies or their sexual feelings we are talking about a transformed mary mind not the former mary who was chaste and loyal so yeah women shouldn't be constrained by or made slaves to their bodies or their sexual feelings consent matters she didn't use the word but back ahead yeah so if women aren't interested in sexuality they can't be dominated by men and she speaks about the basic tenets of education why public education is significant and the role that they can do uh, that, that it can do to make women sensible okay now very quickly let's move on to the remaining people unfortunately i've taken almost an hour to discuss mary wilson craft and the beginnings we have to rush through virginia wolf simon de bouet kate millet and elaine short 
So for that, I'll resort to videos because that will sum things up in three to five minutes. And I hope that uh, we can discuss whatever is left in the middle of all that. Okay, just give me a second. Um, where is this? Yeah. So let's very quickly move on to Virginia Woolf. 137 years later. Wait. I'm sharing my screen with you. And here comes a video. What if William Shakespeare had a sister who matched his imagination, his wit, and his way with words? Would she have gone to school and set the stage alight? In her essay, A Room of One's Own, Virginia Woolf argues that this would have been impossible. She concocts a fictional sister who's stuck at home, snatching time to scribble a few pages before she finds herself betrothed and runs away. While her brother finds fame and fortune, she remains abandoned and anonymous. In this thought experiment, Wolf demonstrates the tragedy of genius restricted and looks back through time for hints of these hidden histories. She wrote, when one reads of a witch being ducked, of a woman possessed by devils, of a wise woman selling herbs, or even a very remarkable man who had a mother, then I think we're on the track of a lost novelist, a suppressed poet, of some mute and inglorious Jane Austen. A Room of One's Own considers a world denied great works of art due to exclusion and inequality. How best can we understand the internal experience of alienation? In both her essays and fiction, Virginia Woolf shapes the slippery nature of subjective experience into words. Her characters frequently lead inner lives that are deeply at odds with their external existence. To help make sense of these disparities, the next time you read Wolf, here are some aspects of her life and work to consider. She was born Adeline Virginia Stephen in 1882 to a large and wealthy family, which enabled her to pursue a life in the arts. The death of her mother in 1895 was followed by that of her half-sister, father, and brother within the next 10 years. These losses led to Wolf's first depressive episode and subsequent institutionalization. As a young woman, she purchased a house in the Bloomsbury area of London with her siblings. This brought her into contact with a circle of creatives, including E.M. Forrester, Clive Bell, Roger Fry, and Leonard Wolf. These friends became known as the Bloomsbury Group, and Virginia and Leonard married in 1912. The members of this group were prominent figures in modernism, a cultural movement that sought to push the boundaries of how reality is represented. Key features of modernist writing include the use of stream of consciousness, interior monologue, distortions in time, and multiple or shifting perspectives. These appear in the work of Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein, James Joyce, and Wolfe herself. While reading Joyce's Ulysses, Wolfe began writing Mrs. Dalloway. Like Ulysses, the text takes place over the course of a single day and opens under seemingly mundane circumstances. Mrs. Dalloway said she would buy the flowers herself. But the novel dives deeply into the character's traumatic pasts, weaving the inner world of numbed socialite Clarissa Dalloway with that of the shell-shocked veteran Septimus Warren Smith. Wolf uses interior monologue to contrast the rich world of the mind against her character's external existences. In her novel, To the Lighthouse, mundane moments like a dinner party or losing a necklace trigger psychological revelations in the lives of the Ramses, a fictionalized version of Wolf's family growing up. To the Lighthouse also contains one of the most famous examples of Wolf's radical representation of time. In the Time Passes section, 10 years are distilled into about 20 pages. Here, the lack of human presence in the Ramsey's beach house allows Wolf to reimagine time in flashes and fragments of prose. The house was left. The house was deserted. It was left like a shell on a sandhill to fill with dry salt grains now that life had left it. In her novel The Waves, there is little distinction between the narratives of the six main characters. Wolf experiments with collective consciousness, at times collapsing the six voices into one. It is not one life that I look back upon. I'm not one person. I am many people. 
I do not altogether know who I am, Ginny, Susan, Neville, Rhoda, or Louis, or how to distinguish my life from theirs. In The Waves, six become one, but in the gender-bending Orlando, a single character inhabits multiple identities. The protagonist is a poet who switches between genders and lives for 300 years. With its fluid language and approach to identity, Orlando is considered a key text in gender studies. The mind can only fly so far from the body before it returns to the constraints of life. Like many of her characters, Wolf's life ended in tragedy when she drowned herself at the age of 59. Yet, she expressed hope beyond suffering. Through deep thought, Wolf's characters are shown to temporarily transcend their material reality. And in its careful consideration of the complexity of the mind, her work charts the importance of making our inner lives known to each other. Not afraid of Virginia Woolf? Then check our book recs list to see which of her masterpieces our team recommends. And thanks to our partners at Audible, you can download a free audio version of any of her books on audible.com slash TED-Ed. By doing so, you'll be supporting TED. All right, the link is on your chat box. And uh, I'm really sorry that I forgot to see that the voice is low. But nonetheless, the link is with you, so you can go back and have a look at it at any point of time. So to keep things simple, because we are short of time, Virginia Woolf, in her room of one's own, on the first place, she was able to write uh, because of the men at her home. I'm not sure how politically correct is that statement to make, but then back then, she was able to write because she belongs to the Bloomsbury group, Leonard Bloom and the people who were along with her, the literary circle that came to her house. It's similar to Madhavi Kuti, those who know Madhavi Kuti, she also belonged to a literary family. And that facilitated her writing style and uh, you know, the, the, the thought processes. Her book was nothing less than a huge library. So uh, nonetheless, we, we credit her. We don't really probe into those elitist possibilities that enabled her to write. But rather, we, we look at the concepts which are radical on their own. The title in itself, um, the title in itself, A Room of One's Own, causes quite a lot of problems, or rather quite, throws quite a lot of light into what she intends. For a woman who is surrounded by patriarchal men who designate what he or she, I mean, what she should do, the best way out for her to express herself is to have a room of her own, which is applicable till date. Even today, uh, many of the women who have been successful in their careers would agree to this. Well, there a debate arises. So before detailing uh, Wolf's concepts, let me also bring in this debate, which keeps happening during the Igno classes, whether it's online or offline. There are learners, especially if there are men around, they end up asking us, sir, are you advocating that women should go away alone and they should leave us? You are also a man. You're also a boy. How would you live without a woman? It's a question that some, at least some students at some point of time, despite all this introduction, mind you, despite all the introduction, people would ask. So, well, that adds to another question to which I shall come back a little while later if we have time. Is feminism all about women? Or can men be feminists? Or, you know, consider it. Can men initiate the same empathetic or same uh, commonsensical processes. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the fact is we, women, I mean, my, my particular perception on this question is that I'm anticipating it, so I'm, I'm answering, answering it beforehand. My perception to this is that a woman should have a room of her own and she also adds to it, it's not only a room of her own, but also some financial independence, some financial capability. So these two doesn't necessarily mean that that should be a radical feministic stance, that women should disregard all men, should just live alone and mind her business. It needn't be like that. Even at a personal space like family, she must be entitled to have a space that is her own, where if required, she could lock herself up for hours and work on her research, her studies, or her aspirations, maybe of writing poems, but for that sake, 
and come out with something productive and be happy about what she's done and the men should be okay with it so kabhi kabhi problem isi pe shuru hota hai that men at home have problem with all these little little things that women have for themselves their me times their camaraderie with other women maybe them going out somewhere them doing the same things that we do it is a shame that in 2023 too we have to discuss and debate about common sensical things if anand krishnamurthy can walk out and uh, maybe go for a scooter ride or a bike ride at say 12 o'clock in the morning or 2 o'clock in the morning with no fears nobody is going to come behind me following me nobody is going to come and ask dey chalta hai kya are you coming with me or nobody is going to molest you know grope me if i can do that any other fellow human being should be able to do that but then when a woman does that eyebrows are raised people follow them people keep asking all these things label them tag them this is just one example take anything i can wear maybe a, a, a bermuda and walk through the city maybe i could ride through the city a woman has a short skirt then the legs become problem uh, something like we have women have legs has to be trending in twitter in 2020 2021 it's a shame that in 2021 you have to say that my leg is not a physical object of your desire ha 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 oi 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 raat ko nikalne ki zarurat hi kya hai wahi zarurat jo hame hota hai na wahi zarurat jo hame hota hai agar hum akele se film dekhne ja sakte to aap bhi ja sakte hai na aisa hona chahiye to wahi that's that's my reply if if you are asking zarurat kya hai wahi zarurat jo aapko hai लड़कियां काम पे जाने की जरूरत क्या है वही जरूरत जो आपको है आप घर आप काम पे जाते हो तो आपका वक्त निकल जाता है आपको तनख्वाह मिलता है आप किसी को पैसा देते हो या घर को पालते पोसते हो तो आपको सुख मिलता है हमें भी चाहिए वो क्यों नहीं सिंपल दिस आर सिंपल कॉमन सेंसिकल थिंग्स बट देन कॉमन सेंस इज नॉट सो कॉमन अनफॉर्चुनेटली कॉमन सेंस इज द लीस्ट कॉमन थिंग दीज डेज और ओवर दर ओवर द एजेस whatever struggles we witness are based on such breach of common sense things right so see human right also comes later mai bolta hu these are basic rights right from the moment we are born if i can do something you must also be able to do something the same thing without questions raised okay so yeah that's an entirely different debate okay let me come back to me, uh, virginia wolf so virginia wolf brings in a room of one so and in her room of one soul she says that she presents quite a lot of problems of gender inequality of bias outright bias so she brings in this fictitious university called oxbridge you know what oxbridge is it's a portmanteau word if you are learning mg5 this is an example of a portmanteau a blend word oxford and cambridge combined together to make oxbridge so in the fictitious oxbridge university beta aisa hota hai ki there is quite a lot of discrimination women can't sit in the lawn alone man can but women can't sit in the lawns women can't go to the library alone and take a book she has to be recommended by any man whether a teacher or a student for her to get a book and she she is also critical of the fundings of the universities universities where men are students the funding is a plenty from the kings from the ministers from the fraternity but women universities have to struggle, struggle and starve she also speaks about the inequality in terms of the food provided in men's universities there will be like biryani every day and in women's university it's like ration better better pad jayega so she is very critical about these things in that work the most central part of that work is about shakespeare's system you would have seen in that video maybe you would have studied it during your graduation days mary um, virginia wolf engages in a discussion on shakespeare's fictitious system shakespeare doesn't have a system per se but virginia wolf presents a hypothetical scenario where what if shakespeare had a system who was equally into theater who was much talented than shakespeare what would have happened to her so back in the times that shakespeare existed she names her judith so had there been judith shakespeare 
Judith could write, all right, but that could not see the daylight. She'll have to keep that hidden under some wraps or she'd have to write and burn it down so that nobody, including her father or brother, sees it. And then she has to lay hidden. As per Virginia Woolf's fictitious story, out of her passion, sheer passion, she gets into a theater house. She works as an apprentice. She writes certain stories to which she's not given credit. She works under a stay under a manager who takes advantage of her. When I say advantage, you know what it means. These days we have these me too movements, right? So an advantage of that sort. He physically immolests her, rapes her and uh, impregnates her. And literally, I mean, and, and eventually she has to meet a tragic end. She dies. Yeah, otherwise women have to use a female name back then. That's something I missed out. Yeah, women had to forge a pen name. George Eliot was never a man. It was Mary Ann Evans, Evans writing in disguise. Okay, so uh, these are the thoughts that she puts forward in her book and she tries to um, contest this. She, she speaks for a space of women, a space for women where women can express themselves freely, a room of one's own. Then comes Simone de Bowie. Again, you may confuse with the spellings. It has nothing to do with the pronunciation that I made. It is this. You may call it at Simone de Beauvoir or whatever you want. But because she is a French woman, the name is Simone de Bois or Simone de Bouet, whichever way you want to call that. Simone de Bouet came with this work called The Second Sex. If I remember correctly, it was in 1949 or was it 53? You may figure out. The Second Sex. Second Sex begins with a very, very controversial statement. Anybody knows the statement having gone through the blogs? So women are not born, they are made. I don't know. Yeah, somewhat, somewhat there, but then the exact quote would be uh, uh, helpful here. The exact quote is in the chat box. Nobody is born, but rather becomes a woman. Nobody is born, but rather becomes a woman. That is a direct reference to the patriarchal conditioning. to undergo conditioning right from the moment of birth you are distinguished on the basis of your reproductive organ and they say this is guy this is girl and right from then the conditioning begins the appearance of the boy is different from the appearance of the girl the dressing of the boy is different from the dressing of the girl up until a major point or even up until death most of the time, men walk free naked, at least half naked. But then women are told how to dress, how to walk, how to talk. Again, I remember this movie Salt and Pepper in Malayalam, where the girl says, after an age, my, my mother taught me to walk like this. And the innocent hero asks her, why so? Right? So, yeah, nonetheless, um, yeah. So in the second sex, she speaks about how gender is a construct. How gender is a stereotypical, creative, patriarchal tool and how patriarchy conditions women to be in a stereotypical uh, mold. And uh, she's apparently highly critical of all those constructs that she speaks about. Very quickly, due to the want of time, let's, let's have a very small three-minute video on the second sex and come back. Welcome to the Macat Multimedia Series, a Macad analysis of Simone de Beauvoir's The Second Sex. One is not born a woman, but becomes one. French existentialist and feminist The Second Sex. One is not born a woman, but becomes one. French existentialist and feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir wrote The Second Sex in 1949 to investigate popular definitions of femininity. 
she concluded that those definitions had been used to suppress women through the ages. For de Beauvoir, the views of individuals are socially and culturally produced. Femininity is not inherent, it is a construct that has been learnt through socialization to keep men dominant. De Beauvoir argued that women have historically been treated as inferior and secondary to men for three reasons. She explained that society teaches women, one, to fulfill a male's needs and therefore exist in relation to men, and two, to follow external cues to seek validation of their worth. Her third point was that females have historically had far fewer legal rights and therefore less public influence. De Beauvoir uses a comparison, saying that a girl is treated like a live doll. What did she mean? A doll is a powerful means of identification. Through it, the girl learns to identify with the condition of being dressed up, made pretty and preened over, whilst not having any agency of her own. She learns to objectify herself, just as men objectify women. The doll is submissive. Its role is to be dressed up, listen to its owner's secrets, comfort her when she is lonely, and lie at home when she is at school. De Beauvoir argues that when the girl grows up, she will find herself in the same situation as her doll. As a woman, it will be her role to attract a husband with her beauty, and to maintain it to ensure he doesn't stray, to quietly listen to his problems, and wait at home for him when he's at work. An accessory, be it plastic or flesh and blood. De Beauvoir stated that even if a woman didn't marry, she would still be held to male standards through external pressures such as the beauty, diet, and fashion industries, which are all complicit in perpetuating the objectification of women. To achieve liberation, de Beauvoir believed women must recognize many of these social norms as constructions. Only then will they have the freedom to escape their context and determine their own destiny. Written against a backdrop of intense conservatism, The Second Sex was published just five years after French women had been granted the right to vote, at a time when few women worked. De Beauvoir's argument that one is not born but rather becomes a woman is still valid today. A more detailed examination of her ideas can be found in the McCad analysis. So I hope that's pretty clear. For those who were there from the beginning of today's class, and just in case you did the crime of thinking, not a Barbie girl was simply just a song played to begin the class. No, not a Barbie girl is a typical response to the stereotypical dollifying of women that you have heard from the popular aqua girl series i'm a barbie girl from the barbie world i'm plastic you can do anything you want from you from me you can dress my hair undress me anywhere you know so that is a reply or a party to i'm a barbie girl not a barbie dog okay so that's precisely why i played that track when we, when we started the day and uh, okay Okay, let's quickly move on to Kate Millett. Kate Millett, sorry, Kate Millett in her work, Sexual Politics. This is also often read on parallel with another work with a similar title by Toril Mui, who has written a book called Sexual Slash Textual Politics. So Kate Millett, in her sexual politics takes this debate a step further. She talks about androgynous texts, male ordered, male centered texts. She says that most of the works that we come across, including novels, are written from the perspective of men and hence the, the women in those works are women who are not real women or like real women but the women whom men want to see and hence not women i hope i didn't confuse you the women written by men are not women as they exist but as 
men want to see or as those who would fill in the pleasures and fancies of men and such stories should be disregarded you may wonder what is the big deal about it the big deal about this is that she dares amidst all the problems that i already cited to you she dares no that she didn't say gynecologism is a term that comes a little while later i'll come to that okay next is that but then she she speaks about or sorry she amidst all these problems miller dares to challenge a few major stalwart men and their works those men are dh lawrence you may know him sons and lovers the other one oh i keep forgetting the name of that um, where the husband is invalid and wife hooks up with the gardener oh man how did i forget the name yeah okay so such faltu ka stories edipus complex and uh, uh, illicit relationships and stuffs that dh lawrence writes henry miller whose tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn the novel is uh, criticized by millet and norman mailer the american novelist who's the naked and dead for using uh, sex to degrade women and uh, she is also extremely critical of sir sigmund freud i wanted to discuss freud today because i couldn't the other day but then we don't have time for that uh, sigmund freud according to kate millet uh, of course according to me in certain ways as well is absolutely senseless uh, his fetish and uh, again uh, an androgynous way of looking at uh, women and their perspectives is highly misleading right from the oedipus complex um, as someone who was so deeply into my mother up until she passed away in july 2021 i can vouch that i have never had any physical fancies towards my mother or a, a resultant enmity towards my father or a desire to fall for my mother uh, though i do like all her characteristic attributes that's a different thing uh, similarly uh, freud's several concepts like uh, premature breastfeeding leads to smoking men who aren't you know breastfed at least a uh, year and a half to two uh, resort to smoking or his absolutely nasty comments like uh, there are comments, i forgot the name of the flower but he refers to a name of a flower which looks like a vagina its scientific name is also something like this vagina or sorry sort of so something like that so he says that the shape of a flower and this is natural that a woman looks like this and all and he also draws this analogy of um, a, a solid thing and a whole we are all adult learners and that's why i'm using this terminology i don't mean to cause any offense if anyone is around you who are under age but then i'm just referring to freudian stupid theories so freud says that for instance there is a key and there is a hole and only the key can unlock that Uh, he's highly phallocentric. Okay, that's one word I would like to add to logocentrism that I already added to you. Phallocentrism. What is phallocentric? Phallo comes from the word phallus. Phallus means male sex organ, penis. So Freud is highly phallocentric in his approaches. So he says that if there is a key. and uh, there is a hole in the lock and only the uh, lock can be unlocked using the key he brings in a couple of other examples as well like i couldn't recollect it randomly so eventually he says that only a penis can lead to a, a vaginal unlock and the, the resultant pleasure in 2023 where the world and the science has advanced we have test tube babies we have uh, freezing of the eggs and uh, we we even have uh, giving child birth without sex or intercourse for its sake so so we we live in a post freudian world where all such androgynous concepts are uh, nullified questioned broken uh, way back in 2016 there was this article published by the new indian express uh, i don't know how whether to take it positively or negatively but then in a corporate it based world in japan uh, that article in sunday express front page claims that uh, working women in japan one are reluctant to marry because they'll be dismissed with the notion that they'll get married and they'll have offsprings and maternity leave has to be given second they they they, they don't uh, they, they have started to undergo uh, breast uh, surgeries so that they don't really look like a woman so several things like that is happening 
uh, across the world, including test tube babies. Another thing that I said, just in case you're not familiar with it, it's called egg freezing or let's say freezing the uh, eggs or saving the summon for a later point of time. And I got a lot of things, okay. I'm not getting into those details, but then these are certain things that uh, would come in handy if you, if, you, if you want to have a look at uh, um, a recent uh, scenario. Then you have quite a lot of other writers, Betty Friedan, the feminine mystique, Germaine Greer, who's written the work called The Female Eunuch, EU, Eunuch, sorry, E-U-N-U-C-H. Then you have Toral Moi, as I've already mentioned. Then comes Elaine Showalt. Elaine Showalt. Talking about Elaine Showalt, what we need to discuss is feminist criticism in the wilderness. But then the first thing that comes to my mind is an essay by her. If you haven't read it, you must read it. It's titled Toward a Feminist Poetics. A must read essay by Elaine Walter, where she brings in this radical theory of gynocentrism. Okay. She, what is gynocentrism? Gynocentrism is study of female writers by female writers or female critics. Not the androgynous thing where a male writes about men and women and are studied by men and critiqued by men. But here female works to be revisited and uh, criticized and studied and read by women. A sort of a sisterhood, a female sisterhood is something that uh, she puts forward. Uh, there are also three terms that uh, she brings forth. Uh, she, she defines three phases of feminism. Don't confuse it with the three waves. And at least some of you would be wondering while lecturing on feminism, <clears throat> why is it that I have not resorted to the three waves concept? The first wave where Wollstonecraft belongs to, radical feminism where Simone de Beauvais, Kate Millett and others belong to, and the third wave from 1990s onwards, which is always questioned whether there is a third wave or whether there is an anti-feministic backlash. So there are theorists who belong to these two. And there are also, there's also a new coinage in the 21st century, post-feminism. So these are all debatable. I'm not getting into them because they're all tentative. They're all tentative lines drawn canonically. So I don't want to get into that shit. But then um, Elaine Showalter speaks about three phases of feminism. The three phases are the feminine, the feminist, and the female. I repeat, the feminine, the feminist, and the female. So what is the difference between these three phases? The feminine, where women writers imitate men. The feminist, where women advocated minority rights and protested. The female, where the focus is now on women's texts as opposed to the merely uncovering misogyny in men's text. As opposed to Kate Millett's critical method, Elaine Showalter proposes an absolutely opposite method where women study and write about women's works. What you can also call as gynocriticism. Gynocriticism is all often a short note. Even though you say that's not part of your syllabus per se, gynocriticism comes as a short note. All right. <clears throat> so talking about feminist criticism in the wilderness, it was written in 1981. And she speaks about how academic feminism takes place. I'm not going, not going to go into the detail because it's already 7.20. Uh, the time is against us. But at least I would say that uh, even today you could see women struggling in the academia to play various roles. Uh, maybe people come to do research being mothers and they are stereotyped. Their dress is being audited. Who they speak to is audited. They are part of gossips and uh, they are bullied. In India, caste, color, everything also adds to it. So she takes a highly critical take on that. You go and read the blog. I'm sure that will be sufficient enough. If you don't understand tomorrow while discussing post-colonialism and Marxism and whatever is left, if we have time, I'll try to come back to it. Uh, 5.4.1 is one premise. Okay, 5.3 and 5.4 is something I would urge you to I would urge you to read if you have time today. And if you have doubts, we'll discuss that tomorrow. I couldn't give you time for discussion and questions yesterday. That's why I'm stopping it a little bit earlier. But 
should i reserve my comments okay i'll reserve my comments for later i have a i have a, a very you know hitting statement to make but maybe i'll keep it to the end don't go away just because i say q and a don't run there are, there are a couple of things i'm keeping for the end and i'm leaving the floor open for questions for the time being the floor is open yes so yes so you mentioned that like uh, in to today's scenario when you see in the post graduate level many women many female uh, has entered but sir uh, th that is also subject specific it's i mean it's my personal observation maybe mm -hmm. i am wrong but then if you see uh, like in 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 this english ma most of them are females i mean it's like 70 30 ratio or 60 40 ratio yeah precisely so that is also one of the like things that uh, sub it's it depends from subject to subject even if the women have come up uh i didn't get you can you can you be a little bit more precise i didn't get the i mean sir i just wanted to say like uh even uh even if we look at the education system or even if we look at how many uh women participate in this education the i mean uh even then there is so much of difference that was my point i'm sorry to bother you can you repeat that once more i'm sorry sorry so to bother still, you. still yeah. there's uh, a lot of difference i mean this gender uh, typical difference uh, like in terms the, of the choice of subjects not only in terms of choice of subjects but in terms of like uh, parents even today in many of the cases send their words to you know based on gender to hindi i mean hindi medium some sent to english medium in the same family like boys are sent to english medium I but get girls it. are I get it. Th th thank you thank you for that point uh, as i told you this these are all larger discussions it won't get over in two hours so one more reference that i can give you because you mentioned it i'll give you a hindi short story we are learning english but i'll give you a hindi short story there is the story called ladki by munshi premchand okay it is an interesting story where premchand goes to a house uh, yes Rudy, they are the same i'll come to it in a minute let me just answer pretty so yeah um what is it yeah so um in ladki uh, the author goes to a household, a domestic household, and there is a guy and a girl. And if I remember correctly, the girl is elder to the guy, the boy. But then the girl is made to do all the domestic chores by her parents, and the boy is pampered and ruined. And even though the girl wants to learn, and the boy actually doesn't want to study, the guy is forced to study and is pampered with all the things, and the girl is forced to sweep and do other things. So yes, discrimination exists even today the laws are not sufficient enough to you know enable a lot of things that it should be uh, the best example is the parliament reservation i i just spoke that i just mentioned that uh, or spoke about that while discussing this reservation for women that to 33 percentage not 60 not 70 33 percentage of reservation for women in the parliament of india we are discussing it for the last 12 15 years when did we become independent 1947 Eight, uh, what is it? Six, uh, what is it? It's 53, 76 years. And you have not, you don't have this idea of equality. Then what equality are you, be, are you going to bring into the system? Parliament, where decisions are made, where um, laws are implemented, where quite a lot of radical changes has to happen. Are or is a male dominant space. And for 33 years, oh, sorry, for 13 years, you have been debating. And Abhi bhi mushkil se pasu hai. And you all know the politics behind that as well. So I don't want to get explicit about that. And then we are talking about all these things. Yes, Param, please go on. And sorry to disappoint you, Param. I'll I'll read this tomorrow. Tomorrow, definitely, I'll make sure that I'll begin my class with this, provided you are here. Thank no, you the... very much. Thank you. No problem. Okay. Yes, go on, Param. What I wanted to ask is, as I understand, mm -hmm. only Elaine Schwalter connect the, uh, the problem or the feminist view with literature. 
all other like uh, mary walton craft uh, virginia wood they write about feminism as a sociological problem it should be a sociology cl class actually but only yes. there there is no connection to the literature in there uh, but that is what i feel i don't know what mm -hmm. is the uh, to literature is it what you mean yeah only elaine showalter she uh, hit the mark you know they have to uh, the uh, ladies should uh, uh consider their work and uh, the literary criticism should be in their viewpoint like that she did it but uh, others i feel like that they talk about feminism as a sociology problem or a sociology subject this uh, that is what i want to know to clear the doubt uh see uh one we cannot say that it's not literary because we read a language of their times and the vocabulary and diction that they used to drive this home uh, especially while discussing mary wollstonecraft i have given you umpteen examples of the craftful way in which she has constructed the language to drive the message home uh, especially her thoughts on co education in particular and uh, regarding the literariness literariness is not only about analyzing literary texts or criticizing the androgynous texts it is also about a sociological uh, approach of what is around us Uh, a room of let's take the case of a room of words virginia wolf indirectly says that this soci this societal setup which is highly patriarchal doesn't let us express ourselves i despite being in a literary family am not able to write because the society is biased if i have to write i have to read i go to oxbridge they won't let me into the library without a male counterpart they are not funding my institutions they are not giving me proper meal they are not giving me equal wages so how do you expect me to write without a room of one's own and a proper financial stability it is absolutely literary we cannot disregard it as a non literary critical sociological exercise it is absolutely literary the moment simon de beauvoir says yes i also missed a biographical point because time was running out just like i asked just like i asked who is mary wollstonecraft we also have to ask who is simon de beauvoir it's actually politically incorrect after having taught you feminism for 2 hours it's politically incorrect to say that simon de beauvoir is the wife of so and so you would have heard this name jean paul sartre who's often used with albert camus the existential writers or philosophers simon de beauvoir is the wife or i should say the other way around jean paul sartre is the husband of uh, simon de beauvoir and uh, uh, simon de beauvoir was a professor back then and uh, even though when we read her work we would we would uh, look upon her as a radical feminist let me also add a digressive personal example jean paul sartre was or uh, he lived a carefree anarchic life well that's a personal thing i i don't want to comment on that but i'm giving you a connection to a novel that you have to study in mg3 the last novel the prime of miss jean brodie by muriel spark if you have read the novel you would know the uh, sort of un imitatable un uh, regardable or what is the word uh, uh, what do you call it? unrespectable sort of teacher that brody is because she has sex with students she or uh, with teachers multiple partners she forces her students to be in a relationship uh, to side with narcissism and quite a lot of things so similarly even though simone de beauvoir appears to be a feminist and has written extensively on feminism she was after all a wife i'm not using it in a derogatory sense but she was after all or she fell prey to that stereotypical roles of a wife because out of the pressure of sartre she smuggled her students to sartre's bed i hope you understand she took her students to sartre to have sex with so well that's it i don't know why i said this i had some connection but i forgot and let's how does say the second sex marks shift in literary criticism which things to be highlighted in highlighted in what i don't know okay uh, it it marks a it marks a transition because like param asked or param said it 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 lays emphasis on how gender is a construct and how women are conditioned in certain ways to behave in certain ways imagine me beginning today's class sometimes i'm crazy and i'm dramatic so i overdo certain things so i actually uh, generally i trim my beard i have this 
normal beer today because I have a lecture coming up Friday. I'll talk about that a little while later. But then, yeah, uh, I, I, some, I had a plan of you know dressing up like a woman with some bindi and uh, studs and uh, mala and maybe a nose ring and all with a sari and beginning the lecture. I could imagine the response. I've done that before. Again, that goes to Rituparnada, the, the, the famous filmmaker uh, from Bangor. He used to dress like women. Uh, I, I still remember stories of people who've been to conferences initially and uh, um, seeing a man dressed in a woman's uh, attire, the way he charismatically conveys to the audience. So I sometimes do that. I, I dress like a woman. Not that I have any feminine attributes per se, or I have such sort of a, what do you call, bin, uh, you know, um, sexuality or anything but then for the sake of a dramatic class or to make it interesting I dress up like that and uh, uh, I, I, I can look at the two responses one is an immediate puzzlement or an immediate shock as in Are sari to hai na? Ye kya, ye kya bana rakha hai? And the second one is a bursting out of laughter even when we clean shave for that like because you because you're used to this daddy the moment we clean shave and go to the college we can see people giggling here and there <laughs> ye kya bana rakha hai? Yeah, I understand the logic behind it, but then, yeah, uh, there are quite a, way, quite, a, quite a lot of ways in which we are gendered and patterned to behave in certain ways. So this patterning goes a long way in certain things. Uh, so that's something I was referring to. So uh, the second sex is radical in the sense that it, it makes us aware of the fact that the gender is a construct. Gender is not to be paid heed to. And just because you are born a woman, you need not live the life of a woman. I hope you get it. You need not live the life of a woman just because you are born a woman. Because more often than not, you may have different sexualities, you may have different abilities. Okay, uh, what is it that you drink which you have during the classes in that huge vessel? It is water. My throat goes dry and I need something to help myself. It's full of an anda full of which I make. Yeah, let me conclude. Don't go away. I'm winding up in a minute. Let me conclude with a statement which I make at the end of all my classes on the evolution of feminism or feminist literary criticism. This is an epic statement, not for women, not for women, but we men, we men. While stereotyping gender roles, while designating the roles of women in the domestic household, I try to apply some common sense also based on my experiences. And I, rather sarcastically, I tell this to my learners. If you are a man, and if you go to the pressure cooker, put the right amount of water and rice into it, close the lid and cook, the cooker will never say, are, are, you are a man, I won't cook. If you go to the washing machine, put your clothes into the washing machine, the washing machine won't say, are, are, you are a man. I won't cook, sorry, I won't wash the clothes. If you take the broom and sweep the floor, the floor will never say, are, are, I won't be saf because you are a man. That's as simple a closing statement, watching for feminism. Whatever gender roles they perform, maybe except procreation for that sake, are something that we can do. And all these utensils or instruments involved are never going to say, like we say, no? You should do this. Why? Because you are a female. You are a woman. So these utensils would never say, because you are a man, I will not cook, I will not wash, or I will not safsafai the floor, or any other things that you want to put into the context. On that, on that wonderful note, a big salute and thanks to all those wonderful women out there. Love you all and wish you all the very best in your day-to-day -day battles. We'll come back tomorrow and we'll have more interesting discussions. Last class, last discussion. So quite a lot of things to do. Everything would be incomplete, we know, but we'll have quite a lot more discussions tomorrow. We'll take further questions. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thank you and good night. Thank you.